Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Emerald Planet. All the ecology news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's your host, Executive Director of the Emerald Planet, Dr. Sam Lee Hancock. Welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. in the United States. We're looking around the globe in 144 different nations, looking for those thousand best practices, technologies, services, and products that are making a difference as we go through the 21st century. And also, too, we're looking for the people, the leaders that are making a difference as we go forward in the 21st century. And as we add 2 billion new people by 2050, we'll have about 9 billion on the planet. How are we going to be able to take care of all these people? And I have a gentleman sitting right beside me who's actually going to share all that with us. This is a world-renowned expert. This is Dr. Lawrence E. Jones. He's the vice president of the international programs of what's called the Edison Electric Institute. And thank you for being with us. Thank you, thank, thank you, Sam, for having me. I'm glad to have you here. And it's just amazing the work that you're doing because you really are reaching out to the world, uh, looking at all different ways of providing energy because that's what's really needed, and particularly on the African continent. Yes. But let's talk a little bit first about the uh, Edison Electric Institute. Okay. What is it, its mission, its vision? And then let's talk about some of the things that is making a difference, the work that you're doing, mm -hmm. and a little bit of your background and how that relates to where you are now and how we're going to go through in the future. Thank you. So the Edison Electric Institute is a trade association that represents all the investor-owned utilities in the U.S. Uh, basically, these utilities uh, provide electricity for about 220 million Americans. Uh, they also are very much involved in the community in terms of job creation, so support about 7 million jobs. Uh, but EI also has an international program, and that program has about 60 to 70 international mm -hmm. electric companies who are members. Uh, and basically, in terms of what we do is basically providing uh, leadership in public policy around electricity, uh, also very much involved in providing business intelligence information, strategic information, and then lastly, convening events to really foster dialogues across the, uh, the U.S. and across the world. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's what we do. And that's really exciting. And we're going to put this slide up here. This is something that uh, people just don't really know what this is. But tell us a little bit about what we're looking at here and why is this so important as far as what you're doing and the work of EEI with the African continent? Well, so basically the, the map you're looking at shows the world at night. Now it's a set of a fictitious mapping that it doesn't really capture the entire world, but what it does is it's a picture that shows where along across the world you have an illumination that basically tells you how much energy is being consumed. Mm -hmm. And what that map tells us is that Africa, as you can see, there is one of the continents that has the least access to electricity for over 600 million people. You know, that's something that you were sharing with me. 600 million people out of about 1.2 billion. Mm -hmm. So that's literally half of the people on the African continent really do not have access to power. Yep. And then there's about another, as I understand, 25%, maybe even 30%, that's intermittent or they have what's called roving brownouts. Yep. So it's really maybe... 15 to 25 percent that actually really has sustained electrical power. Across. Why the African continent that way? Well, I think a couple of things. Historically, I think uh, as electricity grids were being built, one of the key issues is being able to manage those systems. And I think where we, are, where we stand today, in spite of the fact that there's been a lot of investments in the physical infrastructure, we still have a lot of uh, utilities that are not functioning to, to where you expect them to be in terms of mm -hmm. providing access. I think the other issue has been that the infrastructure that has been built uh, for a long time hasn't been maintained. So you have the situation where you have in Africa today, Sub-Saharan Africa especially, you have rising demand for electricity, you have uh, infrastructure that's inadequate, and in areas where you even attempt to make inf investments, you have other issues that sort of uh, curtail the ability to really harness all the, real, the, the resources that you have on the continent. Yeah, and that's why you have these uh, seminars, and this is something that's uh, going on uh, you know, across the continent, all 54 countries, and many people forget, you know, they kind of talk about Africa as being, you know, a nation almost. And the whole thing is, it's not. It's 54 different countries. Exactly. Quite, quite different. Yes. Uh, yet, at the same time, you really have to have people like we see in this room that are uh, getting education, uh, they're being trained, and to look at really not only their own country, but how they fit in, because these countries are juxtapositioned to each other, mm -hmm. like Congo DRC, surrounded by nine countries. Yeah. 
So how do you train people to understand it's much more than my own country or much more than my own city mm -hmm. that I need to be concerned about, particularly on the African continent? Well, I think, you know, the, the image you're showing, that, that, that uh, picture, it basically shows uh, a meeting in, in India. And we chose that picture because it kind of shows the somewhat similarity between India and Africa, right? And in terms of even India having high penetration of people who don't have access to electricity. So the training has to be through dialogues, it has to do through really exchanging relevant information. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of technical training being done, but what I think is relevant for the continent is not just the technical training, it's also the managerial skills, being able to have right management in place. It's also very important to have the right policy and regulatory frameworks put in place. And the reason why I always use India and Africa and sort of a contrast the difference mm -hmm. is because the similarities there is that you have high penetration of folks that don't have access to electricity. But you see progress being made in India, and you see progress being made in parts of Africa. But I think what is key is to really be able to, to, to share that knowledge exchange between different uh, utilities around the world. And that's something we do within the international program of EEI, is to strive to make sure we can leverage mm -hmm. the knowledge and experience from the U.S. And, and Europe and elsewhere and share with folks the utilities in Africa and elsewhere around the world. Yeah. Yeah, and I was a month in India, or just about a month in India recently, and you know, and you see that everywhere. You go into some of these villages. Actually, you're looking at the power lines right above you, mm -hmm. and there's no energy anywhere in those towns. Yeah, and their backup, you know, diesel generator mm -hmm. really is the grid yeah. in some of those places. And uh, but there's a lot of this uh, technology. But you travel all over the world. It's not we're talking specifically about Africa, mm -hmm. but you're going to European countries. Mm -hmm and to the South Pacific, Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. all over. Why spreading all over the world this way as far as EEI is concerned? Mm -hmm. And what are you learning there in, these, say, the European countries that mm -hmm. then you can take to Africa mm -hmm. or Southeast Asia or even Latin America? Well, come a couple of things. So I think, first of all, what's important is that in the spirit of Thomas Edison, the idea is to try to electrify the world and doing something that's significant that will have an impact. And I think if you think of what's happening in Europe in terms of electrification, what happened in the U.S., there are a lot of lessons learned there that you can actually share with other parts of the world. One of the reasons why we work in Asia, we work in Australia and New Zealand, is because many of those countries, they may be small, but they have a lot of innovation being done, mm -hmm. and you can harness that I those ideas and bring them and adapt them. One of the things I always say about energy is that whilst the issues may be similar, it, in the local context, you have to adapt. So it's not a matter of just taking what is done in the U.S. and applying it in Africa or in Europe you have to adapt it to the conditions on the ground. And that's where I think the work within the EI is to make sure we don't just sort of a forklift ideas from one country and bring it to another, but really make them adaptive as we travel across the world. Yeah, and the whole thing about that, you know, we were looking at a scene similar to this where you're sharing and you've got people from different uh, countries. This is a European setting. But the whole thing about it is that not only are people learning what they're taking out into Africa, Southeast Asia, all these other places. But what you can actually bring into Europe, back into the United States, exactly. is innovative and there's best practices going both ways. Exactly. So how willing are you know some of these developed countries mm -hmm. uh, in listening to what they can learn from their brethren you know, in Africa or the South Pacific or Latin America? One of the advantages that African countries have is the fact that they do not have the same sort of a ingrained leg legacy regulatory systems. Mm -hmm. So they can actually experiment with different regulatory uh, ideas and the successes that they have there can easily be brought and applied in Europe or in the U.S. and we're beginning to see it. If you think things like, for example, the idea of using distributed energy resources, right, that could be one thing where African countries could pilot and test these much easier mm -hmm. and perhaps some of those ideas can find their way. So I always talk about what I call reverse uh, innovation, where right. it's not just coming from the U.S. and Europe into Africa, but the Africans can also, given their state of affairs, mm -hmm. do things in a much more agile way that would be beneficial for the U.S. as well as beneficial for Europe and other developing countries or and developed th countries. And I think what you're saying, <coughs> Dr. Jones, is, is that they don't have so much they have to unlearn, which yep. we have in the United States and uh, European countries, even some parts of Asia, like a Japan or a Korea. Exactly. They have older uh, legacy systems. Yeah. But uh, as you travel around the globe, I know you're giving uh, you know many uh, seminars and all that. And the interesting thing about it is that you've actually learned most of this as far as your uh, advanced degrees in Sweden, yeah. of all places. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, you're from Liberia, and yeah. there couldn't be a country really more different than Sweden as far as you know climate, yeah. weather, 
you know, culture, society, and all that. What did you learn there that actually has helped you to be nimble and uh, resilient as well as innovative mm -hmm. when you're traveling around the continent, mm -hmm. I mean the African continent, and yeah. other places that you actually learned during all that time in the colder climes? Well, one of the things I learned in Sweden, and and, and then I talk about it a lot, is the, it's the fact that uh, you know Swedes have a tenacity to to focus on solutions, uh, right, as opposed to sort of a spending too much time bickering back and forth on things, right. There's also this notion of consensus building. Mm -hmm. Swedes are very good at building consensus. And I think in the, in the, in this, the spirit of, of developing our industry, one of the things that EI is pretty good at is our, one of our taglines is power by association. Mm -hmm. well, well, to have power by association, you have to be able to reach consensus. And because we have such a you know, very disparate membership from around the world, as well as in the US in terms of different states, mm -hmm. being able to force consensus on these big public policy issues is very, very important. And that's one of those lessons I've learned from Sweden is that you have to really be able to listen. And also the other thing I will say about Sweden, even though we know we j they just got kicked out of the World Cup, but I should <laughs> say if you, watched it, if you watched the game, the commentators kept saying that the Swedish team played as a team. And Swedes are very good at sort of a functioning as a team. And I think those lessons from Sweden have, have helped me as I traveled around the world. Now we're gonna come back to this, uh, you've got this acronym here. Tell us what this uh, pause uh, means. And then we're gonna come back to it uh, you know, just a little bit. But tell us what this actually stands for. Yeah. And it goes to this collaboration and working together. And we're just about out of time. So OPSI stands for the Africa Utility Power Sector Exchange. It's, it's, a, it's an initiative that was launched by EI in collaboration with the State Department the U.S. Mm -hmm. State Department and the Edison Foundation. And the idea there is to basically foster dialogue between African CEOs, African executives, and U.S. and international executives to really share best practices at the right level. Now, I like this. I'm, we're going to go out on this because I really think this is uh, very clever. But tell us what we're looking at and how is this leading to the development, say, for the next 5, 10, 15 years what? on the African continent as where it's going to go as far as getting the power that it really needs to be world class. Well, in short, that graphic is actually a graphical interpretation of the keynote address by Professor Achempa, mm -hmm. who's a Harvard professor. And what he was talking about was the history of en energy in Africa and the importance of energy in Africa in terms of the impact it has on people's lives. And so one of the things we try to really emphasize is not just electricity or energy, but the impact it's having on the lives of people. Yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. Well, this is Dr. Lawrence E. Jones, the Vice President, International Programs, Edison Electric Institute. And thank you, for, dear viewers, for being with us as we look at the continent of Africa, all 54 nations, how it's changing, and it's gone from about 880 million people to 1.2 billion in about five years, rapid growth, as we create the Emerald Planet. Okay, so we drowned the fire, yep. stirred it, mm -hmm. drowned it again, mm -hmm. and now just feel if it's cold. Yeah. Cool. Smokey just gave me a bear hug. I know. I already posted it. Every time I try to flex Better go on the scale big responsibility. Oh, it's huge. I know, it's huge. You know, and sure. the salary. Oh my god, yes. Right? I mean, like, I was literally, I was about to move with my parents, and <laughs> right before, the, yeah, so this saved me. I, I really believe in you, you know? Thank you. It's nice to hear that from someone. <laughs> <laughs> These are cool. Uh, did you, um, what did you?
Yeah, we've never had that one before. My goodness. Here we go. We're back to the Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. in the United States. And we're looking around the globe for what we call the best of the best. Those thousand best practices, the technology, services, products, and the people, of course, that are making a real difference as we move through the 21st century. And at the same time as that we'll have about 9 billion people on the planet by 2050, we're looking forward to, by the end of this century, maybe 12 or 13 billion. So how are we getting ready for all this? And particularly, uh, many times we're talking about water and housing and all that, but energy really is the key to make all of this work. And that's why we have with us a very outstanding international uh, author and speaker, Dr. Lawrence E. Jones, Vice President of the International Programs for the Edison Electric Institute. And Dr. Jones, welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you here. And you have a very unique word that you're going to be sharing with <laughs> us, and uh, I'm going to let you pronounce it. I can, but I just I love this word. But how does this really relate to everything that you're looking at as far as bringing uh, energy, particularly renewable resources, mm -hmm. to the whole continent of Africa, 54 nations, 1.2 billion people, and yet 600 million are left out, mm -hmm. literally in the dark. Yeah. So how does this word relate to all that and specifically to renewable energy? Sure. Oh, thanks. So you're talking about the word hybridity. Right. So the word hybridity is something I coined a couple of years ago when I started to look at renewables and look at centralized power. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a there's this the notion that to electrify the world there are those who think and say that it's all decentralized. And I said no. And I said no because if you think of the fact that urbanization uh, is growing rapid pace, you have people moving into cities. We really need to think in a hybrid state where you will have both centralized and decentralized. Right. If you think of the situation of renewables, a vast amount of the renewable we have in the world are located in places where no one lives. So if you're going to really scale up renewables, you're going to need to have large renewable power plants, right? And so you have similar large centralized power from other resources, you have large central renewable. My point is we need to think of the world in terms of energy from a hybrid point where you have both centralized and decentralized. Mm -hmm. And I think that is very important in terms of Africa where you have rural electrification, where you could have a lot of decentralized systems for renewable for uh, rural, rural electrification, but for large mega cities like Lagos and Pretoria and, and, and Johannesburg, you need the centralized power plants. So my thing is, let's get away from the idea it's either or. You're going to need both centralized and decentralized, and that's why the coin, I coined the term hybridity. Yeah, and I just love that word. And as it relates to renewable energy, it's absolutely the truth. Because many people think, well, we're instantly going to, you know, go off the grid and do all that. That's not the case. Is because there's, you know, trillions invested in infrastructure. Yes. And many of that, much of that is over 150 or more years to mm -hmm. bring it to uh, civilization. And so as you have a continent that's actually very rapidly expanding, a youth population, yes. because over 50% of the entire population is our youth. And so you really need to have this hybrid system that you're talking about, this hybridary. But looking at this whole thing as far as uh, the research that you've done, uh, the work, the publishing and all that, why the interest in renewable energy? Because uh, your new book is all about that. Yeah. Why? So my interest dates back to when I was a kid. My father was an electrical engineer uh, in Liberia, uh, and he was at the time working at the Liberian Electricity Corporation. He took me to a hydropower plant in Monrovia. I was five years old. And since then, I developed an interest in, in hydropower. But then the more I sort of a, began to look at energy systems, it made sense to me that, you know, at some point you had to harness the sun, you had to harness, you know, other resources. Mm -hmm. And so my interest there sort of a, began to gain momentum. But then when I was in Sweden in 1999, I co uh, founded an, or, uh, uh, an event called the um, uh, uh, Large Scale Transmissions uh, 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 Conference. And basically mm -hmm. the focus was to build offshore grids. And from there on, my interest just continued and continued. And today, most people don't realize it. I, I have a passion for renewables, even though my, my focus of my research was on 
completely different topics, but I've now spent a lot of time on renewables. And I think it's important that you be able to have a very diverse view when you think of renewable energy, because it's not just, it's not just uh, you know, wind and solar, it's, it's geothermal. And I always even consider uh, more sustainable energy, looking at even uh, nuclear and looking at uh, you know, modular nuclear reactors yeah, modular as part, of, nuclear the, reactors, as part of the equation, right? Yeah, and looking at this, you know, as far as these uh, solar panels, I mean, you see uh, one or several of these on people's roofs, mm -hmm. you see them in their backyards. I mean, you're just starting to see these absolutely everywhere. Yes. But also on Africa, on the continent, with so many sun days, mm -hmm. you actually have these massive, uh, you know, solar and also wind farms. Mm -hmm. So looking at that, how do these, as you say, many of these are where nobody lives, mm -hmm. how do you put that into the grid so that you can actually use that but still allow the individuals, if they want to have their own solar systems on their home or on their farm, mm -hmm. that's happening across the African continent, to be able to do that? Oh, you can how do you do balance that? And that goes back to the policy yeah. uh, issues that you have with and again, 54 different governments yeah. all going in different directions. Well, so they're beginning to see some harmonization. So for example, you have the West Africa Power Pool, which is looking at building transmission lines across West Africa, and you have the same thing in South Africa and East Africa. So I think it can work. The issue is as you design the grid, you have to keep in mind now that you're designing a grid not just for a one directional flow mm -hmm. of power, but now bi-directional flow of power. So in the past where you had power just coming from one source, you would now have it coming both from the, the load mm -hmm. or the demand, as well as from the generation. And that means the whole way we design systems have to be rethought of, and, and really the architect of systems in the future will have to keep in mind that the sources will go in both directions. So I think you can do it. It just also requires us looking at the policy and looking at the regulatory frameworks, which is where, again, Africa could leapfrog mm -hmm. and, and basically come up with frameworks that will allow us to do these sort of a bi-directional flow in a way that is meaningful for the utilities, the electric companies to be supplying you know, large amounts of power, but also the opportunity for the consumers to be able to participate. Yeah, and uh, both of us were at the uh, the African Global Summit that mm -hmm. was in Washington, D.C., and it was really interesting uh, the number of the uh, small to medium scale businesses that are in solar, wind, some of them in low flow hydro, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, various types of uh, other renewable resources. But when you look at this uh, image of the grid. Mm -hmm. I mean, it gives you an idea of just how massive and how much the investment is. Exactly. So as we're looking at the future, and this is something I know that you've been studying, but also you're working with through EEI, is how do you balance that so you're allowing people the freedom in you know, many of these uh, far-flung rural communities mm -hmm. to have their own energy, but still feel like that they have the safety net, if mm -hmm. you will, mm -hmm. of the grid. Well, that's the issue, right? So everybody wants the grid, but they want to get off the grid. But I don't think it's everyone want to get off. I think we need to have a regulatory model that allows people to understand that the grid is there. It has to be invested in. The cost of running the grid has to be there to maintain it. I always use the analogy of, of driving on the roads, right? I mean, mm -hmm. someone has to maintain the roads, right? And so we have to make sure that the infrastructure is, is funded, that the recovery of the investments made in the infrastructure is such that it is one where you will have the investors coming to the table and getting involved. We always talk in the U.S. about this so-called regulatory compact. We see it happening in Africa as well, where agreements are being made between governments and the private sector to make sure that the investments in the infrastructure can be there. And the return on investments is, is prudent enough to make sure that the investors will come and is also stable. The environment has to be stable. So I think you can make it work. Um, you just have to keep in mind that the system we're designing for today in Africa has to take in consideration how the, the load and the demand around smart cities and urbanization and water supply. Mm -hmm. It has to be a holistic approach when it comes to Africa and, and the energy system. It can't be one, one side. It has to be holistic. You know, and looking at the, the massive river systems, you know, all over Africa, and mm -hmm. this is uh, not necessarily from there, but just an example, mm -hmm. is that you have this and then you, uh, you're going I'm going to back up here, uh, but you have this all tying these together. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at these smaller systems, these distributed uh, energy systems, mm -hmm. how do they then become a part of this, you know, this more globalized, this more uh, connected mm -hmm. grid yeah. that we've been investing in, say, for the last 100, 150 years? Well, I think you have to bear in mind that as you bring smaller decentralized systems and want to connect them to the grid, you will have to do some re-engineering around the grid to make sure that the protection systems work, to make sure that the uh, even the, the, the information technology systems we're using today are designed in such a way that you can have two-way flow of information because you need that, right? At the end of the day, 
reliability must come first, which means the, the, the utilities have to make sure that we have a balance of supply and demand. You can't have distributed generation injected into the grid any time of the day because it creates an imbalance, mm -hmm. right? And so right. The, the key issue people have to understand is going off grid is fine. Coming back on grid is also fine, but it has to be coordinated. I always say that one of the roles I see for utilities in the future, an important role in Africa and around the world, is one of being a, a real a maestro of coordination. Because mm -hmm. imagine if you have a lot of resources around the place. Well, there has to be one central body that coordinates how those things are dispatched onto mm -hmm. the grid and off the grid. If it just happens randomly, you're headed for chaos. And so what I always say, my father used to tell me this, is that every time you connect something to the grid, make sure you're connecting something to the grid that you will have visibility. So making sure that there is enough mm -hmm. visibility so that the utilities understand what's going on so that you don't just have these sort of a random in and out connections. Yeah. It creates yeah. a lot of Haphazard. Problems. Yeah, you can't do that. Now you're talking about digitizing infrastructure. What yes. does that really mean? And you're saying this is the value added as far as the, the new grid that's being created, which includes these solar panels here going yeah. up on someone's home. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, the hydroelectric dam that's, you know, putting out, you know, thousands of kilowatts. Yeah. Well, these are all digitized. I mean, digitization of infrastructure basically means that you're now allowing yourself an opportunity to use sensors to better measure, manage, and operate your assets, both the grid as well as the, the generation sources that you're connecting to the grid. All that information allows you to not just dispatch the system better, but also do better coordination. And so as you digitize the system, you start adding automatic controls. Uh, the digitization started in the U.S., for example, after the Black of 1965, mm -hmm. when you started bringing more computers into the control room to run the system. You've seen that happen across the world. Now, as you, d you bring distributed resources, the utilities need to have visibility because if they don't know what's happening, we saw cases in Germany, for example, where there was lack of visibility, what that can do. So it's important that as you try to connect all of these different devices onto the grid, there is visibility, which means you have to use sensors, you need to have technology that will allow you to really share information in both directions, from the resources to the grid and vice versa. Yeah, we got uh, time for about one last question. Sure. Uh, I have your book up here, and that really goes in all this, uh, the integration as far as renewable yes. energy is concerned. But looking at all of this as far as the 700 million cell phone uh, subscribers across the African continent. Yes. I mean, they just leapfrog right over the fact that, in essence, there was really very little or, or no uh, landlines. Okay. So how does that apply to digitization and far as the grid itself and future energy. Well, it applies. Okay, it applies. It applies this way, right? It's going to be difficult to just see us leapfrogging off the grid, and the reason is very simple. The reason is because as the grid is designed, unlike the telephone systems, which, by the way, even though people think they're off the system, there's no grid. There is a grid. It's just wireless. You can't see it, right? You have satellites around the place, right? So what you do really need to understand is that you will need to have infrastructure around the place to make these systems work and I'll be happy to uh, talk about it in more detail well, the next we time we meet. certainly do that. This is Dr. Lawrence E. Jones, Vice President, International Programs, Edison Electric Institute, as we create. So I just moved in with this family and it's embarrassing. The little one, he likes to go outside and crawl around in the giant litter box. I don't know what he's doing. I mean, I was born and I knew how to use the litter box. Look at that! That's disgusting! Oh, I'll poop already! You're making me nervous! Oh, okay, I can't look at this anymore. I really hope he grows out of this, for his sake. So, how was work? It was 1300 hours. My math class from 302 was in the trenches. Davy Roth had it the worst. Fractions were coming at him left and right. He just didn't get the damn things. Two days ago, I tried to teach him what one-fourth of one-half was using different sizes of blocks. Yesterday, I tried again by dividing up pizza. Both missions failed. Oh, no. But today, I was ready. I created a combat math game where the only way to beat the enemy is to out-fraction them. Davy conquered every last denominator. My game was so successful, the principal is deploying it to math squadrons all over the school. Anywho, how was your day? Oh, uh, today my boss treated the office to salad wraps. Hmm, <laughs> salad wraps. I know. 150 over 90. 
180 over 111. 160 over 110. I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure looks like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from invisible or silent. If you've come off your treatment plan, get back on it or talk with your doctor to create an exercise, diet, and medication plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhbp.org. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. We're back to the Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you, as we say, looking for the best of the best. Those best technologies, services, products, and processes that are making a difference as we go through the 21st century. And we're doing that on all continents and across more than 144 different nations. As we're looking for the ways that we're actually going to take a planet that will have about 9 billion people by 2050 and possibly 12 to 13 billion by the end of the century. And so how we're going to be able to provide all the basic infrastructure, the food, the fuel, the fiber, the transportation, education, health care, all these things that we need, and especially the power. And I have a gentleman sitting right beside us who's going to talk about some of that. And he has a very uh, glorious way of phrasing all this. And I'm going to read this statement in just a minute. But this is Dr. Lawrence E. Jones. He's the Vice President of the International Programs at the Edison Electric Institute, headquartered in Washington, D.C. of the United States. And Dr. Jones, welcome. Thank you, Glad so to have you here. You. Thank you. I'm going to read this because I, I like this phrasing. It says, what does the phrase, electrifying the continent of Africa requires a cathedral thinking and a holistic solution? What does that really mean? Sounds great, but what does it really mean? Well, just think about how long it takes to, be able to build a cathedral. But cathedral thinking basically means you have to be in for the long haul. It's not going to be built overnight. It's not going to happen immediately. It's going to take time. You have to have patience. And one of the things we see happening, although there is a huge demand for electricity in Africa, we cannot build systems haphazardly. We can't build systems without taking the long view. And when you take the long view, it means you make investments for the future. Cathedral thinking is very important, especially when you start thinking about public policy. You can't have public policy that keeps changing. One of the challenges facing Africa when it comes to electricity is that the government sometimes keep changing. And so when you put in a public policy, I always remind myself of what the, Dan the Danes did. Mm -hmm. You keep it in for the long haul, that creates stability, that creates uh, certainty, and investors like it. What they don't like is the short view where you keep changing public policy back and forth. So cathedral thinking is all about taking the long view. Holistic thinking means you're not just designing the system for one reason. You're thinking about all the different aspects of it. So mm -hmm. you're looking at electricity, you're looking at water, you're looking at education, healthcare, bringing it all together. That's what the holistic thinking is all about. And that's what I think Africa needs. Yeah, we've looked at this map before, but I wanted to go back to this because it really goes to this cathedral thinking and holistic solutions. Uh, Africa, you know, has a real dire need. Over 600 million people are without power. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's just like building the Great Wall of China or the great cathedrals of Europe, mm -hmm. is that some of them were actually done over three, four, five, or six generations. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at this map, as far as Africa is concerned, yes. how do you work with people, you know, through your Edison Electric Institute, that they can look forward to multiple generations. And that's part of the African culture. It's mm -hmm. part of the history. It's part of the DNA of the continent to mm -hmm. do that. Why doesn't that apply as far as electricity and infrastructure that's needed to modernize the continent of Africa? One of the challenges we have with infrastructure like this is that people always take the short view. People think it can just happen overnight. And one of the challenges facing Africa is that when you start thinking about innovation and you start trying to apply these ideas to different aspects of it, uh, you see the need for African governments and others to stop thinking short term. Mm -hmm. I talked about it earlier. But also in terms of the continent, if you look at the vast need, there's so much resources across the continent. The problem is that in many cases there's no integrated resource plan. So you're doing things just by looking at one aspect of it as opposed to looking at everything. So by having holistic plans, being able to look at not just the water systems, but the energy system, and even within the energy system, there's no one size fits all. So it's not just having renewables, it's having the plethora of resources you have on the continent, leveraging it in the right way. And that's why I think it's missing. 
And so if you can do that, I think you'll be able to you know, tackle some of these challenges. Yeah, this is a, a big conference, CTO, the uh, Central uh, Technology Officer. And uh, more and more companies, uh, even governments, mm -hmm. are putting these in. How does that relate to where you have the, the CTO working with, you know, whatever the head, the mayor, the governor, mm -hmm. uh, the president of the country, whatever, mm -hmm. and then all the other uh, bits and pieces as yeah. far as what goes into all that. How does that fit together? And is that the right place, the CTO, or does it need to be in another place to have this long-range view for the African continent? I think it needs to be in multiple places, but the reason why I emphasize the chief technology officer in the context of many African countries is because technology has been pushed onto the continent, and there needs to be people who understand the technology, understand the implication of applying technology, and understand that it's not just applying technology for technology sake, you have to put it in the context of the value proposition, the business, why are you applying technology. And one of the, the gaps we're trying to close in the collaboration we have with African utilities is being able to allow them to start to realize that even though we're a utility, we should also see ourselves as a technology company. And so sure. when you look at the new technology you bring online, whether it's IT, information technology, whether it's new types of devices like energy storage, uh, what new types of generation sources, renewables, but also even the other types that we've used before, you need to understand it from a technology standpoint and then tie technology to business and to the ultimate public policy goals of that country. And that's why I think the CTO is very important in this context. And also tying in the environment because this is one that's of the things that, uh, you know, during this conference, I mean, with to a person, the Africans are very concerned about the environment mm -hmm. as far as how do we protect the land, mm -hmm. the soil, the air, exactly. what we're going to do. And in looking at this, Africa's uh, electric grid, slow evolution or leapfrog. Mm -hmm. Now, I know what your opinion is, but let's just go through this chart right here, why you think some of this will happen yeah. and maybe others may not happen. Yeah, so on the left side of the chart is basically what you, the grid looks like in most part of the world today. It was a traditional one direction of flow. We're going into the right side of the chart where you now have bi-directional flow and you look in the right side of the chart, you have things like energy storage, you have electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. All of these things could and will come to Africa. The challenge is, are we designing the systems now to be able to embrace it? Because in a country where you don't have the grid, you should design the grid for the future on the right, which is the right side of that chart, not on the left. So if you already have these technologies coming, why design a grid that looks like yesterday's grid? Why not design a grid that is prepared to accommodate these new technologies, whether it's electric vehicles, whether it's energy storage, uh, or even whether it's the use of more you know, demand participation by customers? That's the vision that I think and where I think Africa should leapfrog is not just in terms of technology, but also in terms of how they design the systems for the future. Yeah, and looking at this, you had many two-way flows yes. in all of this. So uh, in the traditional system, it was always going out. Yes. And they were taking whatever resources. But in this, you're actually mixing the resources. Uh -huh. So you're using the traditional grid. Yes. You know, very centralized and all that. You have decentralized where uh -huh. people are now starting to generate their own uh, community uh, energy and all that. Yep. And then at the same time, you have the household or the farm level of this. Mm -hmm. I'm putting more farms because in yep. Africa, many in uh, India, yep. which you're familiar with, uh, many of the farms are going to uh, solar wind and other low flow hydro. Mm -hmm. So how do you account for all this when you're looking at everything that's in, in a country and you're still looking at something that even doesn't exist mm -hmm. or existed 100 years ago, yeah. and now all of a sudden we have to put in 50 more pieces yeah. on the chess table. Yeah. You do it by, by taking a holistic view, because I think if you start by looking at the issue of just the systems as they look in the past, right? Many places where I travel across Africa, what frustrates people is the fact that they're trying to build a grid as it looked 50 years ago. What they should be doing is building a grid, but anticipating some of these new trends to see coming. One interesting trend, which very few people are talking about, and I'm going to tell you on your show, yes, Sam, because okay. you'll love it, is the impact of bikes, electric bicycles. Right. If you think of the aging population across the world, places like Africa, having electric bikes could mean a huge thing for mm -hmm. just a civil society. Well, imagine those bikes have to get charged. Well, they have to charge their batteries somewhere, right? So. Charging those bikes require electricity. Once those bikes are charged, you then have the opportunity to create mobility for the aging population across Africa who may not be able to bike. So I think it's very important to understand these new trends, mega trends, and how they're going to affect it. Whenever I talk about electric vehicles, people say, well, Africa isn't ready. Well, 
Africa is where the challenge is, the infrastructure has to be developed to accommodate new, those new technologies. Yeah, and looking at this as African Utility Power Sector Exchange, that's yes. quite a long term, and I think that this is something you had your, your hands in. But how does this relate now that we're, we're moving in this direction, going mm -hmm. back to where we were uh, before, mm -hmm. but yet maybe leapfrogging because mm -hmm. now we're thinking about all these disparate parts mm -hmm. becoming a part of that whole. Yes. So how does this relate as far as having this professional development organization yeah. for the continent mm -hmm. to allow you know the maturation, the maturity of these leaders mm -hmm. who are there, they're very smart, yes. but how do we take it to the next level? Yeah, and I think one of the things that UPSI is doing is creating opportunities for dialogue. And at these dialogues, we've had a few of these in the States already where you would bring African CEOs together with U.S. and international CEOs. When they get together and start to the dialogue, their ideas they're sharing, they can go back and implement them. One of the things that is very different with OPSI is that we are not trying to design a program and say, go and implement this. It's, a, it's, it's an exchange, it's an exchange of ideas, mm -hmm. it's bringing CEOs together with CEOs. It's not about building the technical capacity because a lot of organizations do it. OPSI is focused on building the managerial and strategic thinking around the utilities. And I think that's where you can see a huge benefit for African utilities who are participating in, in, this, uh, in this initiative. Yeah, when you look at this, the complexity of this, I mean, this, this is really a cute chart. I like this. We've used it before, but I think it's fantastic, is where you have everybody, all the different uh, people actually on the board so yeah. people can see it, yep. and all the stakeholders. And then at the same time as they can then plug themselves in, no pun intended, yep. into this whole system. Yep. So how do you take that and then translate that to where you have people like this that are saying, we want to do something, we are going to do something, mm -hmm. and we're going to move forward in a very positive but a coherent, innovative in structured manner. Well, so one example is Ghana, right? So, so Ghana is, is, has signed an MOU with EI as one of the inaugural members of the exchange. And one of the things there is that you think of some of the innovative things that they're doing in Ghana in terms of public policy, what they're trying to achieve, coming together with, uh, with, with the great cool utility in Ghana would allow the opportunity to really look at cutting edge management techniques, look at exchange of how technology should be deployed, mm -hmm. and a couple other things where I think a lot of exchange should be beneficial for African utilities around things like, uh, you know, how you build a grid, how you how you deal with public policy? How do you deal with investors? We, you know, so, so these are things that where I see OPSI really being valuable for African utilities, but also for U.S. and international utilities who are supporting the OPSI initiative through EEI. Yeah, and this is the whole thing about you know exchanging and, and working together, and we'll leave this up because I think it's very important that you have all these people working together, looking. So what do you see as far as UPSI for the next 5, 10, 20 years mm -hmm. as you're going forward, looking more at the long view? What do you see for it? I think the long view for UPSI for us is to have more and more African utilities uh, becoming part of this exchange, participating in this exchange at the executive level to make sure that you have a continuity. So one of the differences between UPSI and other programs is that UPSI is going to be more of a long-term thing, right? So it's not just one year off. It's basically building a relationship between the utilities in the U.S. and around the world. And we'll leave the sign up, Bright Future Ahead. That's exactly what we're talking about with Dr. Lawrence E. Jones, Vice President, International Programs, Edison Electric Institute, and uh, thank you for being here. And uh, thank you viewers for looking at this, how we're looking at the African continent and the way that it's going to be moving forward with UPSI in the future as we create the Emerald Planet. and best friends. I love my sister. My heart, my heart is a sea race. race. Love, love is love. Our family is no less than any other family. Family. Whether it's a short trip or a long haul. Estimated time, 47 hours. They will beg. You're hungry? I'm happy to provide. They will plead. Deep fried butter on a stick. But whatever you do, 
Don't wimp out. Now you're talking. Make them buckle up. They can't hurt. Remember, safety first. Cheese curls. Second. Are you orange? Eva Marie smoked 12,000 packs of cigarettes over 15 years. She quit, and now there's a new lung cancer screening that could save her life. You stop smoking, now start screening. No matter how much you smoked, early detection could save you. Talk to your doctor or learn more at savedbythescan.org. to the Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, and thank you for being with us on a week-to-week -week basis as we come to you from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we're looking around the globe for what we call those thousand best practices, technologies, services, and products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. I'm Dr. Sam Hancock, the President and Executive Director of Emerald Planet and the Emerald Planet TV. And we're looking at the world as far as how do we take these best practices, we share it with the globe, and allow people to select what they need, when they need it, and how they need it. And so this is really an educational forum to share all these best practices we're able to identify. And we became upon a very uh, outstanding person who's uh, sitting right beside me. This is Dr. Lawrence E. Jones, Vice President of International Programs of the Edison Electric Institute. And uh, he is actually a world leader as far as where the power grid is going and how people will be thinking about generating and sharing power in the future. And Dr. Jones, thank you for being here. Thank you, Sam, for having me. Now, I'm going to quickly go to this slide here. This is something very exciting, looking at these uh, 70 international members across 90 countries. What does all this really mean as far as the Edison Electric Institute? Well, what it means is that it allows EEI U.S. members to exchange information, exchange best practices, uh, to look at uh, opportunities for investment, opportunities for co-investments. And so it's, it's basically uh, an umbrella that brings together the global uh, utility sector in a sense because we have members in, you know, in almost every major uh, economy around the world. And the idea of coming together at these different kinds of forums that EEI organizes allows them to really exchange ideas it also allows us to, to share best practices around things like public policy, understanding that what works in the U.S. may not necessarily be applicable in, in parts of Europe, may not be applic applicable in parts of Australia and New Zealand. So not having that opportunity to talk mm -hmm. to one another is something that uh, EI creates, and it really is something that we're very excited about because we're seeing this growth in this interest for international collaboration around electricity, which is, I think, very, very important. Now, one of the things about this, I'm going to talk about it now, and then uh, we get right to the end of the program and we'll talk about it again, but this balance between uh, economic, environmental, and community development, how does all that mesh together? Because as you see this growth, just like the African continent, I mean, just a few years ago, it was less than 800 million. Now it's over 1 billion mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. and I think within about five years. And it's just really, the population is just galloping. Yeah. And no matter what you're going to do, people are going to be on the planet, so mm -hmm. how we take care of them is, is really important. So looking at this, how do we take what you're doing as far as the EEI and then re overlaying that with the goals and objectives of, say, the, the citizens, mm -hmm. if you look at it as the continent, mm -hmm. uh, as far as developing and, you know, being with the rest of the world as far as, you know, the comforts, uh, the safety, mm -hmm. the education, all these things that we need, and at the same time protect the environment. Mm -hmm. I think understanding that trilemma, balancing you know the need for access to electricity, making sure it's done in a way that it's uh, looking at taking environment in consideration, but also bringing meeting the needs of consumers. I think it can be done. It, it has to be done in the context of having the right public policy in place. Mm -hmm. It also has to be done in the context of 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 all stakeholders understanding what is at stake. 
And, and that's very important because many times you have the consumers who want things and expect things, rightly so, and then you have you know, public policy makers and you have investors and you have the, you know, the utilities. So making sure that those groups can sort of a find this common place for exchanging ideas. And so in addition to talking to our, our utility members around the world, we also have dialogues where we sit and, and exchange ideas with regulators around the world. Uh, we have, we're involved in you know, different uh, forums around the world mm -hmm. where we sit with public policy makers and, and share best practices of what's happening. You know, this policy didn't work in Germany. It didn't work in, in the US. It didn't work in Australia. And if you want to apply, you need to you know, understand why, why it worked or why it didn't work. So I think EI, this international program, creates this umbrella where we can have this sort of a dialogue free-flowing exchange of ideas and information, but also understanding the business dimension of it, making sure that uh, investors and others can understand what's happening mm -hmm. around the world. Well, looking at these people, how do you have these common challenges and priorities for the electric companies, for the citizens, for the uh, basic uh, infrastructure within the communities, mm -hmm. so that everybody comes in, they're able to share dialogue, and then they actually go back with something. So many of these things, you come, you talk about it, and then it's shelved until you have the next conference or mm -hmm. the next exhibition or whatever. So how do you allow that to happen so that actually people have actionable items so they go from the table or this group that we see right here in front of us mm -hmm. that they're actually going back and doing something? Yeah, part of our job is to make sure that when these events come to a close, there's a follow through, there's a follow up action on our part as an, as an organization in the international program. We have a newsletter that goes out uh, once a month. We make sure we have that, that keeps information sharing. Uh, we also try to foster this sort of a networking, making mm -hmm. sure that these relationships that have been established lead to something. In addition to having these sort of a large events, we also host organizations on a, on a regular basis. So we've had visits from, you know, from Japan, China, Europe, Africa, just to come in dialogue. So I think the continuation of these kinds of events, the follow-up is making sure that when people go home, they keep talking, keep mm -hmm. the dialogue going, and, and don't sort of just see it as a one-off. And so what we've done now is we've had multiple events where the same set of individuals will come back. And then you can start what they would do last year and, and, and being able to share. The other thing we do within our platform at EI and the international program is we have the opportunity where a utility in, in, say in Australia have a very good news story. And so we organize webinars where they can be in Australia mm -hmm. and do a webinar and share that with their con counterparts around the world. And we're seeing a lot of interest for those kinds of things. We're now even having utilities in Africa also participate, right? And so uh, that's the best thing, just to keep the dialogue going between these organizations and the individuals when they go back to their respective countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, this particular seminar here, and this is something that's very important. But how does EEI help all these different groups? Because you've got 54 countries just yep. on the African continent, yep. and there's about 214 countries and territories around the globe. Yes. So how do you stay connected to all these different people? I know you're, you're doing the blog space and you're doing the seminars and all that. Mm -hmm. But how does the regular citizen plug themselves into this so that it's not just you know top down, yeah. but it's actually bottom up coming from these leaders like we're seeing right here in this photograph, yeah. and they're sharing openly and willingly, but then take it back to their citizens. So one of the things we do, key to our success, has to be partnerships. So we work with organizations around the world. So for example, in Africa, we're working with the Association of Power Utilities of Africa, APUA. Uh, we were in South Africa, we work with Africa Utility Week, because again, we're not trying to go from an EI perspective to go into those countries and try to sort of uh, shape what they do. Mm -hmm. We create a platform for exchange. So basically working with those local organizations. So we have partnerships and strategic partnerships with organizations all across the globe, from Australia, New Zealand, um, you know, Canada, we work with in Mexico. So having those partnerships partnerships on the ground is very, very important for what we do because then those partners can be the ones who become the key individuals to spread the, the, you know, the positive news. The other thing we do is that we've established within the international program our global ambassador program where we have renowned experts in the field in those countries who basically act as ambassadors for EEI. And basically what they do is they tell the EEI story and they help us to understand 
the local situation on the ground where we're going to be going and, and working and, and networking. But partnership is extremely important in what we do around the world. Very yeah. important. And taking that partnership and then go into the collaboration, how does that go to from this uh, networking, mm -hmm. uh, again, these actionable items? How do we take that so people are actually doing something and they take it back into their communities mm -hmm. and feel like, okay, I'm really getting something out of this mm -hmm. as someone that's in a local community. It could mm -hmm. be in the very large urban area like Lagos, mm -hmm. out in a small farming community mm -hmm. with 25 or 30 families. How does all that translate from what we're seeing here? Uh, these very sophisticated meetings mm -hmm. that are being organized through EEI, but it gets to the people that really need it. What is important, Sam, is stakeholder engagement domestically have to happen, right? And so one of the things we've also done, in addition to just looking at the high-level thing, is we've established something called the Thomas Edison International Utility Fellowship Program. What we're doing in that context is that we're, we're allowing uh, up-and-coming folks within those utilities who have perhaps oftentimes more touch points with the, the groups you're talking about, mm -hmm. they come to the states uh, and through the fellowship program, we have two fellows for the first time. We have one from, uh, from Korea, uh, South Korea, and we have one from, uh, from Japan. And basically the intent is that those fellows will go back to their respective countries and be additional ways to spread the, the information and to share the information. I think the other important point with regards to how what is happening at the OPSI level touches you know, the, the, the grassroots, if you may, or the average consumer, is to make sure that the stakeholder process we are using in the U.S. and in Europe and elsewhere, those kinds of processes can be also shared, and that's extremely important, right? So how you engage with your stakeholders to build the trust with them is extremely important. Yeah, and I see this, uh, you know, kind of the, uh, the old proverbial uh, reset the button type of thing, but trust level. How do you get that where you're going across all these disparate cultures, these different uh, countries, and to allow people to feel like that they really do have the trust that they need mm -hmm. is what the information is coming back is mm -hmm. something we can really use, mm -hmm. it's important for us. And at the same time, we're allowed to share what we're doing and how we're doing it mm -hmm. out. Yeah. And so that that hopefully does build trust. Trust is built around three things in this context. One is respect understanding that you're dealing with your counterpart, you're not dealing with someone who's looking to you for information because at the end of the day, a lot of the executives in African utilities are highly knowledgeable people. Mm -hmm. So talking down to them to give the impression that you're telling them what to do is the first no starter. So building the, having the respect for your counterpart is very important. That's the first way you build trust. The other way you build trust is also being able to understand their situation, right? That they have a completely different local context within which they will function. So one thing I tell my staff and we always talk about within the EI international program is that there is no one size fits all. So you don't say what you're doing here is wrong or right. It's different. Mm -hmm. And understanding that is different, making that respect will make people trust you. Many times when I travel to Africa and I, and I sit with utility executives and talk, one of the reasons why I think we connect with them is because we put ourselves in their shoe mm -hmm. now. And specifically for me, what helps me is that, you know, my father was a utility executive and I can, I can talk about the issues in Africa in a way that the utilities will know that I know their pain and their, their suffering in the sense that sometimes it's very difficult to run a utility in Africa because you always have other parties intervening that makes your life difficult. So understanding their situation, mm -hmm. make sure you're not telling them what to do, make sure you, 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 you respect them, creates trust. Yeah, and uh, the last thing, and uh, we're going to be partying after all this, what do you see for the future of EI and this whole thing as far as the fellowships, yep. as far as the outreach into the communities over the next 5, 10, 15 years? I'm extremely optimistic. I think the future is going to be bright. I think energy, electricity is going to be the key for Africa, and I think we have a very good chance to make it work through EI International Program and the rest of our partnerships. Dr. Lawrence E. Jones, thank you for being with us. And thank you, dear viewers, for being with us as we create the Emerald Planet.